Over the years, the Premier League's meteoric rise as the biggest and best league in the world has directly coincided with one thing. It's mass influx in international players. From Brazilians to Frenchmen and Spaniards and Belgians, the Premier League just isn't what it is today without the international talent that we see on our screens week in, week out. However, there's always been one nation that's never fully found a home here. Now, of course, there are exceptions to the rule, but the rule largely stands firm. Italians just don't do English football. But with Newcastle's recent splurge on AC Milan's Sandro Tonali, the question just begs to be answered. Why do Italians flop in the Premier League? To answer this question, we must first look at the history of Italians in the Premier League. Now, if you look at the inception of the Premier League in 1992, we suddenly saw a, a mass influx of foreigners coming from all over Europe, but typically towards the end of their career. It was very rare that a player at the peak of his powers from Germany, Spain, or Italy would come to the Premier League. And the reason for this was simple. At this time, the Premier League was seen as vastly inferior to leagues like the Bundesliga, Liga, 1, La Liga, and in particular, Serie A. See, in the 1990s, Serie A was the best league in Europe, by far. All the best players played there. Milan and Juve dominated in Europe. You still had teams like Inter, Roma, Fiorentina doing very well in their own respect. So with all this taken into account, why would players like Maldini, Vieri, Buffon all leave beautiful Italy where the best teams and players were for dreary, old, rainy England where even the best teams struggled to really make a mark in the Champions League? The answer was simply, they wouldn't. So the first reason for why Italians typically flop in the Premier League is that Italy has never ever sent its best players over to England. Now, in addition to this, Italians are notoriously fiercely loyal to their football clubs. Think Maldini of AC Milan, think Totti of Roma, think Del Piero of Juve. For many in Italy, a football club is like a partner and you wouldn't cheat on your partner. At least I hope not. But in 1996, we began to see a shift in this way of thinking. Ruud Hullett, who was recently appointed as player manager of Chelsea, began to pull some strings, use his name to his advantage, and bring in three Italian players to Chelsea. Gianfranco Zola, Gianluca Vialli, and Roberto Di Matteo. Now, this Italian trio would go on to basically establish the building blocks for everything we would go on to see from Chelsea, from Abramovich to Drogba to Mourinho, etc., etc., etc. They were the ones who really made Chelsea admirable again, almost cool to, to watch Chelsea. Suddenly they had this foreign twist to them that no one else in the league really had, and it was largely down to Rupolet, and it was largely down to the three Italians, and most notoriously, of course, Gianfranco Zola, who to this day still has, I would say, legendary status at Stamford Bridge. Now at the same time, north of Chelsea, a Champions League winner was rocking it up at the Riverside, where Fabrizio Ravanelli, fresh off delivering the European Cup for Juventus, was banging in goals for Middlesbrough of all teams. And in fact, in his debut, he even scored a hat-trick against Liverpool of all teams. Now, Ravanelli's year was filled with ups and downs, to be honest with you, because despite being the league's top earner, shows you how much Middlesbrough needed to part to, to be able to attract a player of that quality to the league and to their club, he was consistently almost complaining about not just Borough, but I would say England as a whole, complaining about his club's facilities, complaining about the culture of the league. He was even quoted as saying, here there's a different culture and a different mentality. The English have tons of money, but they lack the organization of Italian football. Naturally, he'd leave England after one year following Middlesbrough's subsequent relegation. But the loudest, most controversial Italian incoming of that era was yet to come. From fascist salutes to shoving referees, Paolo Di Canio was a character, to put it lightly. But he was a mad genius at the same time, capable of the absolutely outstanding goals that to this day we continue to marvel at. And there's no doubt that he was crucial to really establishing what the Premier League wanted to be in an era and a time where they were really struggling to find their identity. Now, as we would go on to see, the Premier League would find its identity. But it turned out that Italians didn't really have as much to do with that equation as they had originally suggested. In 1998, when Italy released their World Cup squad for that year's tournament and the name Gianfranco Zola was missing from the list, eyebrows were raised, especially in England. But the reality was it was kind of to be expected because again, while he was really doing incredible things in England for Chelsea, back at home in Italy, it wasn't really looked at with the same enamor. In fact, like I said, Italians doing it in leagues outside of Italy were kind of looked down upon. Like I said, going to England at that point was almost seen as like a final step in your career. And in fact, when you look at Zola's age and Vialli's age when they left Italy to go to the Premier League, it kind of backs that point up. 
In fact, Italy's entire Euro 2000 team that went on to the final that year didn't feature a single player from outside of the Serie A. And they'd repeat the exact same trick six years later when Italy won the World Cup in 2006. Not a single player from that World Cup winning team played outside of the Serie A. But after the match fixing Calcio Poli scandal in 2006, things started to shift a little bit. Juventus, for starters, being relegated to the second division, became almost something of a garage sale. And in fact, that was really the first real steps in Italians beginning to venture outside of the Serie A before they turned 30 years old. You had Zambrotta who went to Barcelona, you had Grosso who went to Lyon, Cannavaro went to Real Madrid, Luca Toni went to uh, Bayern Munich, you had Barzagli who went to Wolfsburg. All of a sudden you had Italians kind of stepping out of their comfort zone and playing for teams in Germany and Spain. Yet not a single alumni of the 2006 World Cup winning Italian team would try their luck in England. From that moment on, 2006, I think it's safe to say that their star kind of began to wane as a, as a footballing institution. Now, at the same time, this was really the mid to late 2000s where the Premier League was becoming, as we all began to see it, the best, most competitive league in the world. Now, like I said, the decline of the Serie A coupled with the surge of the Premier League was kind of damning because you saw the, the style for both, right? The Premier League was becoming known as a grit and grind league, in my opinion intensity, speed, athletes, aggression, physicality. That's what you went and, and saw when you saw Manchester United, when you saw Chelsea, Liverpool. Arsenal were a bit different, but even Arsenal's invincible teams had those elements in their play. The Italian football was always more tactical, more well thought out, more methodical, but in that era of football that we were kind of heading towards in the late 2000s, it was the Premier League's style that was becoming more and more predominant and more and more successful when it really mattered. You saw it in the late 2000s, every year in the semifinals, you would almost always have English teams, whether it's one, two, three, potentially even four English teams competing for the Champions League. And when I say those words, physicality, aggression, intensity, tenacity, they're not really words, like I said, that you associate with Italian football. So as the Zolas, the Di Matteos, the Di Canios all started to kind of head out the back door, their successors really struggled to grasp the English game in the same way. Matarazzi, Taibi, Diamanti, Dosena, Aquilani, all names really that we consider and associate as massive Premier League flops. And as cliche as it sounds, guys, it's down to the fact that Italian footballers coming in at the time couldn't cope with the intensity and the speed of the Premier League the way that French players could, the way Portuguese players could. They couldn't cope with it the same level that those other European ex imports could. Take Alberto Aquilani, for instance, seen as the ideal Xabi Alonso replacement at Liverpool. And when he arrived at Anfield, he had the world of expectations on his shoulders. He was a very good player at Roma, despite having injury problems. Three years and only 28 appearances later, he was flying straight back to Italy with bust stamped on his passport. Mario Balotelli was briefly seen as like the new hope for Italian football. Someone who kind of had the traits and abilities that I kind of mentioned in terms of power. He was an athlete. He had a ferocious shot on him. A, a real super talent, a wonder kid, if you will. And to this day, he's still actually the only Italian footballer to ever win the Premier League. And although he had his good days coupled with really bad days, of course, at Manchester City, his time can only be remembered for one thing. And it's the one assist that he had in the 2011-12 season to Sergio Aguero for that goal. But still, a few years later, he makes a move to Liverpool. And again, after one year, he's out of the league for good at 25 years old. However, it's really Jorginho who epitomizes the Italian in England better than anyone in my opinion. Seen as almost like a Busquets or Andrea Pirlo region of sorts when Maurizio Sarri brought him from Napoli to Chelsea, his new club. This was seen as a massive coup. They beat Pep Guardiola and City to his signing. And although you can never doubt the contributions that he's made for Chelsea, especially in the Champions League run that they had in 2021, it was more so always his European showings that definitely, I would say, outperformed his England ones. When he played in the Premier League, you could get at him, especially from a physical standpoint. In midfield, he could be overrun, but in Europe, he never really seemed to have that same issue where it wasn't exposed as often as it was in the Prem. Borriello, Nocerino, Darmian, Zapacosta, most recently Scamacca. The names go on and on and on. And as I continue reading them on, the success rate dwindles further and further and further. Which takes us to Sandro Tonali. 
His arrival on Tyneside just last week for a record-breaking fee for an Italian footballer was received with raised eyebrows both here and in Italy. How has Newcastle managed to pry a boyhood Milanista from the San Siro? Why are they making an Italian footballer their record signing in the Premier League? And can Tonali finally break the mold and be an Italian that shines in the Premier League? Ultimately, time will tell, but I would say that the initial signs are actually promising. Tonali is not your ordinary Italian footballer. Don't be fooled by the long flowing hair, or the, the Brescia and AC Milan links. This is not an Andrea Pirlo regen. He's much more of a Daniele De Rossi or a Gennaro Gattuso with their bite, with their tenacity, with their intensity. And I think that might actually work in his favor in the Premier League. Not to say that Andrea Pirlo would have never succeeded in England, but I think he would have had to adapt his game to a different style of football. Whereas Tonali is nowhere near the level of Andrea Pirlo, but maybe his game translates better immediately to the Premier League. Players like Tonali, Chiesa, Gnotto at Leeds are perhaps evidence that Italian football is finally shifting its mentality and beginning to produce and develop players that can ultimately exist in the modern game. One where technique and skill and tactical nous are great and you must have it, but it must also be accompanied by tenacity and intensity. And when you do combine those two, then you can only really truly compete at the highest level in football. And as for getting an Italian to leave his boyhood Serie A club, money talks. So, in the age of Premier League money reigning supreme, maybe Tonali is just the first one of many Italians to come to the Premier League at the peak of their career. However, only time will tell whether he's more Di Canio or Diamanti. Guys, this has been another video. It's myself, Lies. I'm telling you, every single week, I'm trying to give you guys something new, something insightful, something that's not just your typical transfer story or where do you think this team will finish next season? A lot of channels are doing that. They're doing a great job of it. But my goal with this channel is to give you guys new, insightful, thought-provoking content. And maybe bring you guys back to, again, a place in time where... Okay, I'm not from the 90s. Maybe that's a little bit before me. It's more Fuad's time. But again, bring you guys to a different time in football that you guys might not be so familiar with. So if you guys did enjoy this, this video, make sure that you guys subscribe, turn the notifications on so that you guys don't miss anything coming in in the future, which I do have a lot of content coming your way. Like the video, like I said, subscribe, notifications, all that good stuff. That being said, it's been your boy Lies, and like I always say, we'll see you when you see you. Peace.